All right. All right. Okay. Oh, wait, no, not Hello. Hi, you guys should be online now. Okay. Let's see if we can get the screen going. Excellent. And then there we go. So if people could join into this. Uh, I'm going to hold off on discussing the homework just because we're short, relatively shortish on time. And so I'd rather make sure we do the new stuff. Also, I've uploaded some video solutions to some of them, and maybe that would help with people um, if you have some questions. So we'll, next time we have class, we'll go over that homework and anything that we'll do today. I'm taking everybody off mute, but if you decide that you don't want people hearing you, you can always put yourself back on. I just want to make sure that people are able to speak and they can only have to unmute them first to make sure of that. And then, are people able to see the um, Pear Deck screen that's up? <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, John. Wait. Mr. Locker, go right. Are we supposed to join Pear Deck on our own computers or just like look on through your screen? You can join on, you should be able to join on the uh, computer. You probably have to switch to a browser and switch back to the Zoom stuff. This morning, some people found that it was better if they were, um, it would work better if they used a different browser. So, like if you're logged in on Chrome into Zoom, then use like Firefox or Safari. Getting it isn't clear to me as whether we're getting a recording now. All right, I think things are being recorded. We might end up not getting a recording at this session, it was acting flaky before. But I'm gonna give everyone another minute or so to get into the Pear Deck, and then I want to dive in. Is there a way to make Pear Deck like not you the full screen? Like I can't. Like, is there a way to not well, make it full? Like Pear Deck or for the? I mean this thing. I don't even know. Like I, Zoom. In Zoom, I think there's a thing that lets you say. Maybe on the window. Let's see. There is a way to do it. I'm not offhand sure. Although I wouldn't be surprised if the usual Apple thing was sort of hovering up near the top. So we can bring up the. Uh, it's okay. I figured, I figured it out. Got it? Found it. Okay. Yeah. It's a little tricky for me because I have the control center open, so I'm not seeing exactly what you guys see. Okay. All right. I'm going to move forward a little bit. If you're logging into Pear Deck, remember that the, um, the code always appears in the bottom center of the window. So. All right. So hopefully you see this thing. We're starting a new chapter today on Chapter 10, a thing called Conic Sections. Today is going to be a taxonomy, so it's going to be a bit like biology, like here's a thing, let's talk about the thing, and then here's another thing, and then we'll start doing more with it in the second, the second lesson. So on some level, bear with me, although it will be interactive, there'll also be a fair bit of like, this is what it's called. Um, these are pictures of the conic sections, and the basic idea is that if you take a cone and then double it, have like a double-tipped double cone, and then slice it with a plane, a sheet of paper, it generates a bunch of standard curves, um, which are called conic sections, because section in the sense of cutting. Um, and you can generate the circle or the parabola or the ellipse or the hyper hyperbola, uh, which are curves that you've probably had passing acquaintance with so far, but which we're going to get to in great detail. And they're sort of unified, it was not originally understood, but they're, they're unified by this kind of weird projection that they're all really just parts of what you do to cones and planes. And actually some other weirdness that goes on once we know that, but it'll be there a little bit later. Um, you might have noticed that for today, uh, 
Canvas asks you to watch a two minute video. And if you haven't watched it yet, then please watch it by the time we have the next class. And it just walks through with some nice animations of why these things appear when you slice a cone with the, with the plane. All right, but these are the four types that um, if you go parallel to the base of the cone, you get a circle. If you slant it to the base of the cone, you get an ellipse. If you go parallel to a side of the cone, you get the parabola. And if you go perpendicular to the base, you get the hyperbola, which is the only one that can intersect twice. And so it's the only one that has a double wing session. Um, so we'll come back to each of these characteristics. And we won't do a whole lot with a 3D projection per se, but it's useful to have sort of in the back of your head. All right, circles, you know, we start with circles because they're friendly and easy. Um, they're really not all that tremendously interesting, but at least, like I said, they're simple. Definition of a circle is all points located at a fixed distance, which we call the radius, which are a fixed point, which we call the center. So for instance, this circle is centered at two comma minus two, and its radius is five. In modern usage, we've been a little bit sloppy between whether the radius is the segment connecting the center to the circle, or it's the length of the segment. And we actually kind of use the same word for both, which is, to be honest, a little bit kinky, but we do it. And it's almost always clear from context whether you mean the, the physical segment or just its length. And so if it's ever unclear, feel free to ask, but it usually, it's kind of hard to not know which one fits. All right, so we'll do our first quick pair deck, which is just what is the radius of this circle? And let's make it fast-ish. All right, let's see if we have any. Excellent, so everybody who bothered to answer at least um, correctly got, or at least we all agreed on the radius. If we go back just too quickly, right? And you can, you can pick from anywhere that you want to pick that. Usually you pick the center and kind of go either east or north or you know, something direct, but anywhere along the grid that you can read is perfectly fine. All right. And then what is the y coordinate of this circle? And again, this will be fast, but Pear Deck doesn't let you enter points, which is a little frustrating, but there you go. I'll admit it's a little freaky as a teacher that there's not the usual cross chatter that we have in the classroom, but that's fine. Not saying I miss it, it's just a little strange. All right, and everybody agreed on that as well. And again, that was just an exercise to remind you that you know how to find these things. Part of the reason is that we're about to come up with other things that are defined similar to, but not quite the same as the center and the radius. And I just wanna make sure you feel comfortable pulling stuff out of graphs. Today is largely gonna be pulling stuff from graphs and then tomorrow or next class we'll be largely putting stuff back into graphs. All right. All right, so then an ellipse looks sort of like a squashed circle, and that's not a, that's in no way an accident or coincidence. Um, its definition is sort of like the circle on steroids. So it says that it's defined as the circle of all points for whom the sum of the distance from two separate points is a constant, or the, the sum is the same for no matter what point you pick. Each of those points are called, uh, each is called a focus, and together they're called foci. They sort of play the role of the center of a circle. But the ellipse also has a center, which is located halfway between the foci. Um, I'm actually going to switch off this and go to the place where I can write for a bit. But we'll come back to the other one, just so we can put the notes together. So the thing to notice is sort of there is still a thing called the center, and it is halfway between these two things called the foci. Um, foci come in this original definition. We're not going to talk a lot about them after today. Um, for a couple days, and then they kind of come back with a vengeance. The original definition of this worked entirely from that, and people didn't know it was a conic section. So there's some sort of archaic historical stuff in here. The major axis of the ellipse is the longest axis, the longest segment you can draw between uh, any two points, and they come from sort of the long end 
to the other long end. So this whole thing is the major axis. And the minor axis is the one perpendicular to that. And that goes sort of from the, pure, the shortest one that you can draw. Each end of the transverse axis gets a term called, gets a name called the vertex, right? Uh, we won't really care much about it, but the ends of the minor axis get a special name. Some people call them vertices as well. I think our textbook calls them a co-vertex. We're not gonna worry about that too much, but just to know that that's sort of out there. Uh, it is important to understand what a vertex is. The co-vertex turns out to not be very interesting on that. All right, and then weird terminology. The segment from the center, from one end of the major axis to the center is called the semi-major axis. Here it means semi as in half. Uh, and we symbolize it with A. And the segment from one end of the minor axis to, from one end of the minor axis to the center is called the semi-minor axis. Again, just meaning half the minor axis. And the length is the length is called. Wait, sorry, where do we see the semi? major minor axis, because I don't see. All right, so are you guys not getting, okay, let me see, that happens from time to time. I think the share got killed. So definitely please pipe up if that happens. Oh, I um, see. It seems to lose track of the sharing thing. Let's see. Are we back? Nope. Oh, yeah, now I see it. Okay. I'm actually not sitting up here. All right, so let, let me um, certainly be explicit, please, if, it, if that goes away, because that, that has happened before. Uh, so let me go back and talk about, so I'm, I'm sorry, I made all these casual ge gestures and you didn't see them. So it's let me recap briefly. So here's the ellipse, it's just the same ellipse reproduced three times. And the ellipse, the definition of the ellipse is that if I pick any point on the ellipse, the distance from this point and this point, if I add up those two distances, they're the same. So no matter where I go, the sum of the two purple segments is the same as the two blue segments, um, which would be sort of useful. And those points that we're drawing to is called, are called the focus, and the center is defined as halfway between them. The major axis is the thing that goes from sort of one end, one long end to the other. The minor axis goes perpendicular to that, which is the shortest guy from one to the other. And the vertices are the end points of the major axis. That lets me get back to, um, then we define these symbols. So A is defined as half the length of the semi-major axis, and it's this length. And B is defined as the length of the semi-minor axis, it's this length. And then C gets no special name, which is sad for C, but it's the length from the focus to the center. Um, Wait, are you yeah. on something? Like, Is that one more Are you like showing, like? Okay, so is anyone, you, oh, you yes. should be seeing stuff. If you're not, then I need to reshare it. So hold on a second, let me reshare it. Is that better? Do people, you should now see an ellipse that has an A, B, and C on it. If you're not hearing that, you should chime in and tell me, which means you probably have to unmute yourself. All right, I'm going to switch over to the Pear Deck bit because everyone was seeing that. So we'll do there. It's going to be hard for me to take notes. All right, but this is what we were just talking about, features and ellipse. And most importantly, the definition of the three letters we're going to be using a lot, especially in this case, A and B, which are going to be crucial for this and the next thing we do. All right, so A is half the length between the two long ends of the uh, ellipse and the B is half the length between the short ends of the ellipse. We're often, just like with circles where we're casual with radii, here we're often casual about whether the semi-major axis is the segment or its length. And again, it will be clear from context if you need a number, then clearly it's the length. If you're talking about a geometrical thing, then it's, then it's the, uh, the segment. All right, A and B define the ellipse between the two of them. So right here I have a ellipse, all of which are have uh, length A, semi-major axis A, with different values of the semi-minor axis. And you can see that basically as A gets larger, as B gets closer to A, the ellipse kind of gets closer and closer to being a circle. It kind of gets less and less squished. And if A equals B, then we get an actual circle. So what we find here is that there really aren't circles, they're really just special cases of ellipses. 
Wait, where's A? Sorry, I don't see it. All right. So you are you looking at the Pear Deck window now? Yeah. Okay. So A is the thing that goes between the origin and sort of the, the minor guy. Um, hard to say. I can't, I can't draw on the Pear Deck, unfortunately. I don't think I can edit it. So if you go to the origin and you go due east, yeah, where all the ellipses cross, that distance is A, which in this case is six. Uh, and if you go from the origin and you go north, where each time it hits the the ellipse, it gives you the new B. So that blue that blue ellipse has a B of one, and the green B has the green ellipse has a green a B of three, a little further out. And then five, and then finally the last one is six. And you can see that A equals B, we get a circle of radius six. Okay. All right. And I really don't want to stress the circle is just a special case of ellipse. Um, because it has less symmetry and ellipse can be oriented, we're only going to talk about um, two orientations, vertical or horizontal. And we assign the orientation of the ellipse as just the orientation of its long axis. So the blue one is a vertical ellipse and the red one is a horizontal ellipse. But they have the same values. So they still have A equals 4 and B equals 1. Right? And that's important to understand that A and B are relative to the direction of the ellipse and not to X and Y per se. All right. So why don't we take this as a quick see if everyone's up to, sp up to speed. Um, just pull the value of A for this ellipse. Horizontal ellipse. People over time. All right, at the moment, I've only got three people who give a response. So if you're having trouble following along, it really is important that you unmute your mic and let me know. Um, or I suppose theoretically, you could send an email. I can pop up and check my emails. All right, so this is what, this is, oh, there we go. <laughs> this is what people responded. There were only four people. Uh, it looks like we have either four or looks to be maybe two. So if we go back to this, our major axis is always the long axis, so it's the horizontal axis here. The green dot is the center. So if we talk, we measure from the center to one edge of the long axis. We go from um, one to two. How do you know which one's the major axis? All right, so that's a good question. Um, this is not. This is going to sound snarky, but I'm not being snarky. Which way is this oriented? Is it horizontal or vertical? Uh, horizontal. Horizontal. So the length, the, the transverse axis, or, or the major axis will be horizontal. In other words, whatever the longest axis of the ellipse is, that's going to define A for us. OK. All right. So are we OK that that's four? The other, uh, the other so the other, actually, probably the next thing will ask you what B is. Let's see. Nope. So, that's, so going back to this one. A was four, B would have been two if it had asked for, for B. So if you put in two, you pulled a correct length, but it turned out not to be the one we wanted. A is always along the longest axis, and B is always along the shortest axis. Wait, so if A is along the sh longest axis, axis shouldn't it be eight? Uh, but it, for reasons that will make more sense in a day or so, we take half the length of that axis. Okay. All right. So and then. And for B, we take half of the other axis. Okay. And is the value of B half of the minor axis? Yes. Okay. So it is entirely an accident that B happens to be half of A in this guy. That's not always necessary. But B is okay. half of the short axis, and A is half of the long axis. Gotcha. Just, this it's sort of in your head. You can think of it like how the radius is half the diameter, right? The diameter goes from end to end across the circle. 
what we care about from the center to the end, so we take half as long. All right, so let's see. Let's get people up on this one and see how we're doing. All right, let's see where everybody was. All right, so notice it nicely converged down to three. I had some people who changed their answer right at the end, but that's fine. Uh, and I assume the other one is two. So what we are getting is that people are pulling the right numbers out, and it's just which one's A and which one's B. So I'm going to give you a bit of a cheat. So the ellipse A is always the bigger number because the ellipse is always measured in the stretchy, the stretchy part of the ellipse. So if you get, if you see this and you say, oh, it's either three or two, then A has to be three. In this case, this is a moderately vertical ellipse. Same sort of question. Notice carefully it's asking for B, not for A. Wait, so I know you can use the cheat, but like how would you actually know that A is the bigger number? A is always the bigger number. Because A is because the orient, A is always the length of the major axis, and it's called major because it's big. Right, the major axis is the long side, and A is always half of that long side. Okay. These have been particularly pretty, and they probably will be for you to read stuff from graphs. There's obviously no reason it couldn't be like fifteen point seven, but. For the ease of reading, you can pretty guess, pretty much guess they'll be integers. All right, so we have most people are saying four, and I'm going to guess the other one was six. So if we go back to here, um, if we go up from the center, we go six units. And if we go over from the center, we go four, right? Because the center is at two comma minus three. If we go up to two comma three, that's six away. And if we go over to six comma minus three, then we get four. Since a is always longer for the ellipse. A is always the bigger one. A in this case is going to be six, and B is going to be four. I got most people saying four, so yeah. All right, and just for future reference, when you see the notes, the um, yeah. are A and B always positive? Yes, because they're lengths, so they okay. have to be positive. No, that's that's good, especially when we do equations in a couple of days. It's good to keep in mind they have to be positive. Put their links. Good. All right. So this is sort of a quick and dirty uh, draw type thing. Just make a mark next to any statement that's true. I'm going to start a timer and then start it again. So we have about two minutes. It's going to lock in five minutes, but I'm going to add another minute to it, so you're going to have a chance to 
benefits of that. All right, so let's see everybody together. We have pretty strong agreement on A and B, and that's correct, so yay for that. We have a little bit of disagreement on the center and the orientation. So I'm gonna hide everyone for a second. So minus five minus two would be over five and down two, which would be the bottom of the ellipse, not the center. Um, somebody actually marked the center, which is actually great. It's, all right, so that black dot is the center, and that's not that's minus five plus two. So that was just sort of that was sort of just entry level. A is never less than B, so that one can never be right. And then I, I'm gonna predict that possibly because this year it's happened all along, you guys still need to brush up sometimes on what horizontal and vertical mean. But in this case, the long axis of the of the uh, ellipse clearly runs up and down, so it's vertical. And everyone's A and B were right, so. For that. All right, so we're going to switch figures. We'll probably, yeah, we'll get through this one. We probably won't get through both of the ones that remain, so I'm going to um, modify the homework. So when you sit down and work on it, give me a couple of minutes. I probably won't get to it until about three, but I will sit down and, and adjust the homework. Basically, we won't talk about parabolas at all, so if you see anything that's a parabola, just you can stick it on the homework. All right, the other guy we're jumping to, and it's a little weird because you know parabolas and you might not know hyperbola, but we're going to talk about hyperbola because it has a natural, sorry, it has a natural connection to the ellipse. The ellipse was the um, set of all points where the, where the sum of a distance from two fixed points was constant. The hyperbola has the difference of two fixed points is constant, and it gives you this weird bowed shape that comes up. Again, it has a center, which is halfway between the foci. And then the line segment, this gets a little strange. The line segment connecting the focus, the two foci intersect the hyperbola at two points. Those points are called vertices. Each one's called a vertex. And the transverse axis is the segment that connects the vertices. So the transverse axis, which means the across axis, goes across from one branch to the other, kind of plays the role of the major axis in the ellipse. Right, they're sort of evil twins of each other. And the transverse axis is like the major axis. So again, half the transverse axis will get the symbol, the symbol A. All right. Um, there is, in fact, a thing symbolized by B, but its definition is not nearly as geometrically obvious. So I'm going to punt on it for a couple of slides. Right. Um, the wings of the hyperbolae. Well, a hyperbola will approach two lines as you zoom out, and you can click on that link. I'm not going to do it because I think it will break the the, um, the recording that we're doing. But if you click on that link, you'll get to a thing where it just zooms out on the parabola, and you see that the parabola gets closer and closer to being like an X, where there are just two lines at the middle. Each of those are called asymptotes, which is something we've run into long before. They're the shape that the hyperbola approaches as X or Y gets large. And the distance from the vertex to an asymptote perpendicular to the transverse axis is what is symbolized by B. So B is that weird orange thing where we go over A from the center, we hit the hyperbola, and then we go up B. Right. So let's practice a few of those. Um, oops. All 
All right, we have only about 10 minutes left. We'll see what we can get through. And let's say just another 30 seconds on this or so. Uh-oh. Sorry, I just did something weird to you. Oh, I just did something weird to you. It's just not giving me the option to, to put stuff on Pear Deck. It's not giving, it doesn't give you three or four things unless you type one? No. Huh. Maybe I have to refresh it. Yeah, maybe hit refresh and see. Okay. That will do it because other people are getting in. So. Okay. I think it's there. But you might miss this one. That's okay. All right. So our good news is that everybody picked the same one, and the, the one we picked was correct. So yay. Uh, the vertex, you'll notice, uh, sorry, the center is also where that X crosses. So not to get all like Pirates of the Caribbean, but X literally marks the spot here for the center of hyperbola. And that will be useful for us in a day or so as well. All right, more tricky. Let's find A for this hyperbola. This is a little bit less obvious. All right, again, we had mostly convergence on five, and the other probably was two. So remember, the transverse axis is the thing that connects the two vertices to cross each other, that crosses through, and it's the distance from the center to either one of those. So sort of the distance from the center to the closest approach of one wing. So if we start over at minus one comma minus two, we go over to six comma minus two, and that's a distance of five. So if you look at five, yay for you. How about B then? I'm going to make this one fast. All right, so here we have either two or two and a half, which maybe is the counting. If you go, in my eye, I'm looking from the, the crossing point, the center, over to the right. And so I'm at minus, at six comma minus two, and then I go up to the, the uh, asymptote, which crosses the axis, so that's two higher. So we would end up with two as our value of B. Right. As illustrated here. And again, remember these notes will be online. These notes will be online at some point, um, as well as hopefully this video, so you'll be able to look back at that. All right. Hyperbolas also have orientations, and we define the orientations being the orientation of the transverse axis. And A is always the length of that transverse axis. For hyperbolas, A can be smaller than B. All right. Ellipses, it can't from their definition, but for hyperbolas, they can. They can. All right. So these new hyperbolae um, have a vertical orientation going from one wing to the other, we go in a, a vertical direction, and they have different values of B, which are two, six, four, and six. And I'm sorry that Google kind of messed up the label on the bottom, but there's a regular note pop up there. All right, there's no special case, like the ellipse has a special case of a circle. Nothing happens, unfortunately, for hyperbola. If A equals B, it's just a highly symmetric 
that verbal other doesn't, we don't get any special shape that pops out. Okay. So let's do we'll these two and then we'll actually basically be done. Let's find A for this, and I think the next one will be finding B. So look at that. Okay, and we have universal convergence on two, so yay for that. We go to the center, in this case, we have to go up two. To get oh, wait, to, to get the, to. The answer is two? The answer is two in this case. Oh. All right, we go to the center, which is where the X crosses. And in this case, it's a vertically oriented hyperbola, so I go up to one of the vertices or down, either way. Uh, and I go from being at Y equals two to Y equals four, which is the distance of two. All right, let's do this one in, let's call it maybe 15 seconds. And then I'm gonna time it. Let's call another, say, seven seconds. All right, so I'm happy to see that no one picks skew, which is what we haven't talked about, and you don't need to talk about it. On the other hand, we have a class exactly evenly split between vertical or horizontal. So remember, the orientation is the orientation of the transverse axis, or literally connects one wing to the other wing. And if that's a vertical line, then the, the hyperbola is vertical, and if it's a horizontal line, then the hyperbola is horizontal. So in this case, going along the y-axis, gives us the transverse axis, so it's a vertical parabola, uh, hyperbola. So the answer would have been B. All right, and let's do maybe one more of these, sorry. Probably about one more, and then it's probably gonna throw us out, but I think we're also basically done with um, hyperbolas. All right, so mostly agreement either four or five. So we go up, same guy, right? So we go up to um, the y-axis and at, at four on the y-axis, and then we have to go over and it looks like we intercept the asymptote at five. So if you go up to the vertex and then over to the green line, you get a distance of five. So I so think- I we're about to lose the connection and we're basically done. There are a couple of more examples for hyperbolas that you can use to, to walk through it, but um, I'm going through it really fast, but, and the notes will be online. Eventually we're gonna get to features of parabola. Anything in your homework that looks like a parabola, just skip for now and then you'll do it uh, tomorrow. And like I said, I think we're literally about to get cut off. I, if the recording worked, then I will upload that within the hour or so, and I'll also try and do a couple of the problems as video solutions. Okay. All right, folks, enjoy the rest of your snow day, I hope. Bye. Thanks.